Amen. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Rare ass good things. Thank you. Thank you. Let's turn it out to face more. Thank you. Appreciate it. God, I pray that you would be present in our speaking, our hearing, our understanding, and more importantly, our living of your word. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we do pray and ask all things. Amen. Um, as we entered this 10th year and praying about what God would do and how God would move through Kaya, we... we we sometimes pack out and laugh and have a good time and spend way too much time talking about relationships. Um, and I've begun to sense that God wants to supplement some of what we do in Kaya, and we'll still do relationships every now and then, we'll still laugh. But I think it's important in this 10th year, at least for me, um, to be able to add to it some areas of study that help grow us in our discipleship in our walk, in our understanding, and in our living. It's one thing to come out and laugh and have a good time. It's another to start bearing fruit. And after 10 years of being Kaya, I think it's important to kind of add to it. So tonight is a kind of venture out into that. Um, it's gonna be a little bit deeper than we normally go. I wanna apologize. Um, when I, we initially sat down and planned this Kaya, my mind and spirit were in a much different place. Um, and that's changed over the last literally 24 hours. Um, and so I bring to you something kind of hot off the Holy Ghost press um, <laughs> that I didn't have time to put a PowerPoint together. So we're going to go old school uh, with a whiteboard and a marker tonight um, and pray that you still be able to keep up. So I was at a pastor's conference about maybe a year and a half ago, and they put us in different groups. And these groups were pastors of various churches, sizes, different length of pastorates. And the facilitator engaged us in an icebreaker that was kind of embarrassing to me. Um, to be in a group of pastors, uh, we were given a piece of paper and we were given a quiz to see who could name all 12 disciples the fastest. Um, and after 10 minutes when nobody had all 12, um, I really felt insufficient as a pastor that I couldn't name all 12 disciples. I want you to think, how many of you just by a raise of hand, honest, because the Lord knows, could name all 12 disciples. If you name all 12, hallelujah, I don't feel bad. All right. Um, so we were tasked with naming all 12 disciples. And just so you know, you can find the names of all 12 in the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew chapter 10, in Mark chapter 3, and in Luke chapter 6. So once again, Matthew 10, Mark 3, and Luke 6. Um, and what I didn't know when we started putting it together that most of the disciples were pairs of brothers that were related to one another. Um, Peter and Andrew were brothers. James and John were brothers. Thaddeus and another disciple named Simon were brothers. Matthew and another disciple named James. He's called James the Lesser. Um, I don't know if I'd appreciate somebody calling me the lesser, um, but James and Matthew were brothers. Then you add to the list Philip, Bartholomew, who is sometimes called Nathaniel, and then the last two whose names we do know, Thomas and Judas. The second part of the icebreaker, we were asked to talk about what we know about the disciples, their character, their personality. Strange, if you read in the Gospels, there's very little information given about the disciples and their character. The one disciple who we know the most about is? No, no. I mean, okay, yes, we'll come back to Judas. That, that, Judas is a good answer. Okay, Judas is a good answer. But there's one disciple who we get a lot of information about. We see him all the time. He's always talking. He's always jumping up. His name is Peter, right? We know a lot about Peter. Uh, beyond that, we know a little bit about John, um, only because John goes on to write the Gospels, and then we get him in Revelation, and we get him in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And just as a way of teaching, John was the only disciple to die a natural death. All the other disciples are executed. 
John is the only one that dies of old age on the island of Patmos from where he writes the book of Revelation. Teach, Pastor Wesley. Um, <laughs> beyond that, we know a little bit about Matthew. We know that Matthew's former career was a tax collector. There's some Sunday school folk in here. Matthew was a tax collector. And then we know some things about Thomas and Judas. We know Judas because he is the betrayer. And Thomas is infamous because he's given the name Doubting Thomas. We were asked to rank the disciples in terms of their faithfulness. And here's what's amazing. Whenever you read the list of the disciples in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they always start with the same disciple and end with the same disciple. The list starts the same and ends the same. Who do you think always starts the list off? Peter. Peter is always the first disciple listed. And who do you think is always the last? Judas. Peter is always ranked the highest. Judas is always ranked the second lowest. I mean the lowest. And what's amazing is that in that listing, usually right before Judas is the name Thomas. In terms of faithfulness, Thomas is not known as being a Peter or John or Matthew. As a matter of fact, Thomas is just slightly above Judas and we give him little credit because he didn't betray Jesus but he's known to be the one who did what? Doubted Jesus, That's, doubted the resurrection of Jesus. That's why he gets the name Doubting Thomas. As part of the icebreaker, we were then asked to identify which disciple we most saw ourselves in. It shouldn't surprise you in a room full of preachers and pastors that most of us aligned ourselves with Peter. Most of us said we were like Peter. Peter was bold and courageous. Peter never had a thought he didn't share. Peter was saved, but he wasn't delivered from everything. You remember Peter in the garden, he's got a knife on him. He's hanging with disciples and he's armed. <laughs> they come to arrest Jesus and Peter takes a knife and cuts off a man's ear. Peter is a sanctified gangster. I like me some Peter. And Peter fell and got back up. He denies Jesus three times, and yet he still rises to be the leader of the Christian movement, a reminder to us that our failures do not always define our destiny. A lot of us said Peter. And as I was sitting there and they asked me which disciple I most saw myself in, my answer was Thomas. Stay with me for a moment. Thomas gets a bad rap. We rank him slightly above Judas. He does one thing in one passage of scripture that lasts three verses, and it gives him a name that has followed him for thousands of years. What a shame to make a minor mistake that is then labeled on you for the rest of your life. He gets the adjective doubting Thomas, because of what happens in John chapter 20. You may remember John 20. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He shows himself to the apostles who are in the upper room. Well, at least most of them are there. The Bible says Thomas is not with them. So when Jesus shows himself, Thomas, the disciple, doesn't see it. The disciples leave the upper room. They go and find Thomas, and they say to him, listen, we've seen Jesus. He is alive. And Thomas's response is, I got to see it for myself. The next week, they're back in the upper room. Jesus shows up again and Jesus allows Thomas to touch the hole in his hand and in his side. And when Thomas sees and Thomas touches, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says to Thomas, you're blessed because you have seen. But even more so will be those who have not seen and yet still believe. And because of that one moment, Thomas gets the name Doubting for the rest of eternity. But I want to suggest to you that Thomas represents something much deeper than someone with doubts. Thomas represents something that lies within each and every one of us at some moment in this journey of life. 
Let me paint the picture about Thomas. One thing we do know, Thomas is a disciple. There's no doubting that. There's no denying that. He has followed Jesus. At no place does he deny Jesus. At no moment does he betray Jesus. Thomas doesn't even say, I quit and I don't want to do this thing anymore. Thomas, without a shadow of question or doubt, is a believer and follower in Jesus Christ. When the other disciples come to him and tell him that Jesus has written, has risen, Thomas doesn't doubt that the Lord has risen. He doesn't even doubt that it's possible. He doesn't deny that Jesus is risen. All he says is, I need to see it for myself. He makes room for the possibility of the resurrection. He just needs to experience it in a different way. It's not the resurrection that Thomas doubts. Thomas doubts the report of the disciples about the resurrection. Say with me, we're about to get a whole lot deeper. Tell somebody, tell them, hold your breath. We're going deep, we're going deep. <laughs> Thomas does not doubt that Jesus could have arisen from the dead. He just doesn't believe the report of the disciples. What Thomas's issue is, is that he doesn't believe what the other believers say he ought to believe. Stay with me. He's a believer, but he doesn't believe what the other believers told him he ought to believe. Okay, one more time. I believe the Lord. I follow the Lord. I'm a disciple of the Lord, but I don't always believe the same thing other believers say I ought to believe. Thomas represents the disciple who doesn't always agree with what other folk think he ought to believe. He hears what other people are teaching and saying and proclaiming and preaching, and he says, I don't think that sets with me. Thomas represents that space where we find ourselves in disagreement with some of the other things other disciples are saying, and we won't relinquish our position. Have you ever found yourself sitting in church and you heard something preached and taught and inside you something just said? <laughs> Have you ever heard a preacher or a church push a theology out and it just didn't resonate with the God you know in your own life? Have you ever found yourself evolving in your thinking about God? Shame on you if your theology is the same you got from second grade Sunday school. As you grow and walk and experience God, there's something about walking with God that changes what grandmama taught you and what mama gave you and what Deacon Johnson said and even what your pastor preached. But you can have experiences with God that make you go, I don't think. That's right for me. Thomas gives us the space to disagree with other disciples. And here's the beautiful thing. Can I tell you something? Jesus never called him Doubting Thomas. There's nowhere in the Bible where he's called Doubting Thomas. You want to know who called him Doubting Thomas? the church that came afterwards and looked back at him and said he didn't believe everything we said he ought to believe, so we're going to give him a negative label. That's a label from folk who rejected Thomas because he rejected what they were teaching. Which means this, I don't always have to believe what everybody else believes in order to prove that I'm a disciple. Jesus says I can still be a disciple and disagree with you. And beloved, one of, I think, the greatest problems of Christianity is this fake and false thinking that we're always going to think the same about everything. And if we don't, we label. We label those who don't agree with our own thinking and theology. But Jesus 
never called him Doubting Thomas. He called him by his name. It simply means that there are areas of grave disagreement within the body of Christ, and we've got to make room for people to think differently about God than you think. To have experienced God in a different way than you have experienced and not label them. What I want to begin doing periodically in Kaya is taking a moment to look at the areas and the issues and the doctrines within the church where we think differently. Where my thinking may not be like yours, where my belief may not be like yours, but we're both disciples. But we think differently about some things. I can only do it in Kaya. Oh, I found out last year the hard way that every environment is not safe to stretch people's thinking. Um, that Jude 3 panel I was on was an eye-opening experience for me. That everyone doesn't think at the same level. Everyone's not open to the same different thought. So I bring this to Kaya because it's the only place I can really work it out in public. This ought to be a safe place for us to think, to grow, and to look at things from different angles. I pray that if you come to Kaya that you have an open mind. And my goal in doing this is a few for One, I want you to know what you believe and why you believe what you believe. But even more than that, know the consequences of what you believe. So many people take faith positions and don't play out the consequence and don't see how their position, which seems innocent right here, when you play it out, it does damage in another body, part of the body of Christ. So I want you to know what you believe in these certain issues, why you believe what you believe in this issue, and know the consequence of what you say you believe. But beyond that, I'm hoping to get you to understand the validity and the logic of people who think differently than you. One of the worst things that happens in the body of Christ is that we demonize people who don't believe the same way we do. Not understanding that there's a valid reason and there's some logic for how they landed over there. You may not agree with where I've landed, but at least validate that how I got here was sound and rational and biblical and theological and that I'm not some heretic. I'm not on my way to hell. I'm not damned because I think differently than you. And one of the things that helps us in learning to love one another is to validate that we think differently and it's okay. We're going to be different and, diff and we're going to think differently on certain issues. And what I want to do is pull out some of those issues and share with you what the different positions are and hopefully help you locate where you are in that position, why you are there, are you moving from there, and can you respect someone who thinks differently than you do? Is that okay? Does everyone see what I'm trying to do? Yes. All right, so let me be clear on what I'm not trying to do because I know how this goes. I've done this before and I got labeled. Um, number one, I'm not trying to make you think what I think. I've said this a thousand times at Alpha Street, and I'm going to say it tonight. My job is not to make you think what I think. My job is to make you think, right? At least be aware of the issue and figure out where you stand in it and what the consequences are. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to believe like I do. You don't have to think like I do. I promise you, when you get to heaven, God is not going to ask you why you didn't agree with me. I promise you. So I'm not trying to make you think what I think. Number two, I'm not even trying to advocate a certain position. As I grow as a teacher and a scholar, I realize that my greatest calling is to expose. Not to push, not to advocate, but to expose. So I will intentionally expose you to things I don't believe in. So because I expose it does not mean I believe in it. I want the online crowd to please hear me clearly. The fact that I 
share a perspective does not mean that I believe that perspective. It means I understand how that perspective came to be, even though I may disagree with it. Please, so let me say this so everyone gets it. I am a born again believer in Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus when I was six years old. I was baptized at Leadville Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. I confess him as my personal Lord and Savior. I love the Lord with all my heart, and I believe I'm going to heaven when I die. Now, that being said, can we deal with some other stuff, all right? All right, exposure. So I want to identify some issues where there's diversity in the body of Christ, and I want to remain more doctrinal than moral if that makes sense. I want to deal with doctrinal issues and not moral. I, I, I don't want to sit here and show the difference of opinion on pro-life versus pro-choice. That, that's a moral issue. That's a political one. I'm, I'm not here to try to persuade you to be inclusive in your sexual identity and orientation and acceptance of same gender. That's my personal position. That's not me trying to push that on you. We don't need to have that debate. Those are more moral issues. I want to stick to some doctrinal ones right now and then find our way into other areas. So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to raise an issue. I'm going to share with you some of the different positions in that issue. We're going to talk about what's at stake in each position. I'm going to hopefully get you to leave with some questions that you're going to think about, pray about, search and research to understand your own position and to challenge you to mature from it, to understand the broad spectrum and where you stand. So if you're confused, let me tell you, we've done this once already and it almost worked well. It almost worked well when we asked the question, is salvation only in Jesus' name, right? And I share with you the great diversity of Christian thought. If you remember, there are four positions. I put them up real close. You've got the exclusivist, right? We've got the inclusivist. That's not spell right. Inclusive. Yes, it is. All right. We've got... The pluralist, and very, who said that? Go, you make me so proud. And the universalist. For those that weren't here with us, so we raised this issue. Is salvation only in Jesus' name? Right? And I share with you that within the body of Christ, there's not just one answer. There are actually four. There are those who are ex exclusivists. These are the people who say only in Jesus. This is the John 14, 6 crowd, right? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This is the Acts 4, 12 crowd. There's no other name given under heaven whereby you can be saved other than the name of Jesus. And there are people in your pew who are exclusivists, Jesus only. The inclusivist, which is where I stand, is the brother or the sister who says, Salvation is in Jesus' name, and it may be possible for there to be salvation outside of Jesus. I don't know, but I believe that it is possible if God is bigger. It's possible for God to be bigger than my own religious experience, right? So to, so to clarify my position, because it almost went well and then it didn't. Um, <laughs> the best way to think about an inclusivist is this. Let's say we seal all the doors and windows of this building. And we are in this building and we are all in agreement that God is right here with us, that this is where God is. The exclusivist says God is in this building and God is not outside this building. There's no way God is outside this building. Now, this building can be your religion. It can be your denomination. It can be your church. It can be your theology. But the exclusivist says God is not outside of this box I have him in. The inclusivist says God is here. And God is so big, God may be out there. Now, I don't know, and I ain't going out there to find out, and I'm not telling you to go out there and find out, right? But I'm telling you, if God is God, by my definition of God, God has to be bigger than anything I can conceive. And so is it possible that God is out there? Yes, it's possible. The pluralist is inside the car, and the pluralist says God is all out there. God is outside of Christianity. God is over in Islam. God is in Buddhism. God is in this religion. God is in that religion. God is everywhere where people are religious. The universalist says, everybody's saved. Okay. 
Jesus died, his death was so powerful, everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's saved, let's all have a good time, right? Four different positions. And I challenge you to figure out which one you're in and understand the challenge of being in either one of these boxes. That's what we did, and we're gonna do it again tonight, okay, in a different area of doctrine. Everybody with me? All right, let's erase, let's get into another area. Before we get into it, I want you to go back to the passage I read at the opening of Kaya, Genesis 11. Genesis 11 gives us a chord of the Tower of Babel. Just by wave of hand, and it's not embarrassing because we're here to learn. How many people have never heard of this story before in Genesis 11? Never, never heard of Babel? You, y'all ain't telling me. I'm going to try it again. How many, how, all right. How many people know of this story? You've heard of this story, Babel. Okay. Babel. What's going on in Babel? Well, all of humanity is gathered together in one space. They speak the same language. And according to what happens in Genesis 11, they build a city, and in the city, they build a tower. And the intention of the tower, according to Genesis 11, is to basically build them a stairway to heaven. They want to see what God sees. They want to know as God knows. They, in essence, are building, they're making an effort to build something that puts them in the same position as God. God sees what is happening. And God comes down, and God scatters them over the earth, and God puts different languages in their mouths. This is the Bible's attempt to share how people became different in language. So once again, they're building a tower to be where God is. God comes down, God scatters them, and puts different languages in their mouths so that they can't speak to one another. Everybody got that? We're in agreement. Okay. Within the heart of humanity, there is and always has been an attempt to see like God. Humanity has always tried to construct ways to empower ourselves in such a way that we can almost be like God, especially religion. Religion, some can argue, is a human attempt to build the staircase that gives us absolute assurance about the God we serve. And so we come and we proclaim and we preach and we teach Bible because we're trying to give you assurances about heavenly things. We want you to be absolutely certain about the will of God. We want you to know what God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. So we're building the staircase. And when God sees the attempt of humanity to have absolute divine certainty, God scatters. God's response to human attempt to attain divine certainty is diversity of speech. Don't miss this. When people want to think they know everything about God, God scatters and says, talk differently, think differently, see differently, because I'm too great for you to know me with absolute certainty. Listen, you all, let me know if I get way out in the deep end. All right, R roll me back in. We use a lot of adjectives about God. Holy, loving, merciful, gracious, kind. But you know what adjective we don't use enough about God that's one of God's greatest attributes? Mysterious. What does it mean to be mysterious? It literally means not being able to be ascertained with human understanding. So Paul, when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, this is what he says. He says, you know what I am? I am a steward of the mysteries of God, not the certainties of God, the mysteries of God. And the fallacy of religion is that we have substituted the mysteries of God for the certainties of God, and humanity can never have full, absolute certainty about God. 
God's ways are higher than our ways. When you deal with God, you are dealing with a mystery. You can't fathom this God. You can't understand this God. You can't predict this God. You can't limit this God. You can't religiosity this God. He's so much bigger than anything we know. And God is a mystery at the end of the day. And we only know God as God chooses to reveal himself. So watch this. So when there's an attempt to have certainty, God creates diversity. Because the way to deal with the mysterious God is to accept that people who are different are still godly. They may not think like you. They're godly. They may not talk your church language. They're godly. They may not think like you do. God intentionally created diversity to remind us that you can't have absolute certainty. So how dare you take your minute, microscopic understanding of God and use it as a tool to judge someone else? That's what I was trying to get to. (laughs) You know this much of God and you want to judge somebody else? None of us are experts in God. It is impossible. All right. So I say all that because as we go through these different issues, you're going to see people who are in different positions, and we have to acknowledge that standing in a different position is the will of God, that God intentionally created diversity in thought and speech as a response to our attempt to have divine certainty. So people who think differently, that's God reminding you God's bigger than you think. All right. I'm going to have to write on this one day, I promise you. I promise you. All right. So let's look at an issue where there's great diversity. We, ju- we just touched on one as a recap, which was, is there salvation outside of the name of Jesus? Where I want to begin our journey in Kaya that's going to carry us through the next few months here and there is the second great area of debate within the body of Christ. Who called it out? The authority of Scripture. Jesus, keep my mind. How much weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, does the Bible have in your life? How dependent are you on Scripture to know God's will? How Christians see the Bible has become very diversified, particularly in the last 40 to 60 years. There are, I'm going to try to divide the different positions up into three. Um, Three perspectives on Bible. Um, On the one hand are the fundamentalists. It's the most common position. It's the most historic one. The majority of Christian history has had a fundamentalist perspective of Scripture. Um, I'm going to put some terms up on the board. Um, can I erase this? Because I need, I need writing room. Is that all right? Can I erase this? Everybody's taking a picture. All right. <laughs> few words, few terms you need to know. walk you through this. This is the fundamentalist position. All right. All right, let's say it together. Sola Scriptura. We learned tonight. Sola Scriptura. Anybody got a headache? This is just, just too much? 
So, you really raised your hand, man? Uh, sola Scriptura, infallibility, inerrancy. Here's a Greek word you need to know, theotokos. Okay, you see theo, you know what this is, theo, theology, theotokos. We'll talk about them. The fundamentalist position of Scripture is this. Um, sola Scriptura, Scripture only. For the majority of the history of the church, there's this belief that Scripture alone was the authority. So these are the people who, when a question arises about what is right or wrong, their first response is what? They ask this question, what does the, what does the Bible say, right? Fundamentalist question, what does the Bible say? That whatever the question is, we can answer it in Scripture. That's sola scriptura. Infallibility and inerrancy are core doctrinal beliefs in a fundamentalist position. Infallibility, the Bible can never fail. Inerrancy, the Bible's never wrong. The Bible has no error in it whatsoever. It is a perfect and pure document. You cannot be ordained Baptist without knowing the definition of infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. It is core of what it means to be Baptist. Because at the end of the day, Baptists are fundamentalists. Baptists are supposed to say, what does the Bible say? God said it, I believe it, that settles it, and that's the end of it, right? Theotokos, Theotokos, that is a doctrine that basically argues, Antonio, that all of Scripture is inspired by God. Everything in your 66 books is literally this. This is what Theotokos literally means. Everything you read is God breathed. God breathed it out. So what happens when someone has a perspective that all 66 books are God-breathed. They can't be wrong. It came out of God. God is without error, therefore the Bible is without error. Just by wave of hand, how many of you all know this is where your grandmama was? Your grandmama was all day, Bible only. She could quote passages you didn't even know were in the Bible. <laughs> this is the belief that everything the Bible says is 100% accurate and true. These people tend to read the Bible literally, right? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. This is the seven days and heaven and earth were made. This is that every miracle you read was literal. This is the Bible is without error. There's nothing in error or untrue in the Holy Word of God. It's a fundamentalist position. Now, there aren't many in your generation who hold to this. Unless you were raised like old school, Baptist, Pentecostal, Kojic, Apostolic, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, Sanctified Holiness Church, you're probably not here. Most of your generation has kind of abandoned this, right? Um, most of us have landed in a place where we realize that there's an element involved in Scripture that we have to take seriously the human element. And this is why we've abandoned this theotokos, because although it may be God-breathed, we also know human hands are involved, particularly in three areas, right? We know, number one, the writers were human. As much as we like to believe that the Bible just dropped out of heaven, we know that men wrote the Bible. Men who were limited in knowledge and understanding of the world. They were men of their time. And so with this understanding that the writers were limited, there are those who look at scripture and say, well, how could Moses know how the world was created? Moses was, if Moses is the writer, which by the way, most scholars debate and will tell you is incorrect, 
But if Moses is the writer, how do we expect a man of 500 BC to understand evolutionary theory and cosmology and the creation of the earth? That, that knowledge did not exist. So there are those who say what Moses is simply trying to do is give an ordered account of how the world could have come into being. It's not as if God took Moses up into heaven and deposited the detailed instructions of how earth was made. Moses came back down and wrote it. That's just not how it works. Every human being whom God uses is flawed. Let me say it again. Every human being whom God uses is flawed. And here's the glory of God, that in spite of the flaw, some truth comes out anyway. Right? That, that's why we come to church. Listen, I, I, I'm going to let y'all in a little secret. Don't tell nobody, all right? What I'm about to tell you, don't tell nobody. You promise? I'm flawed. I'm flawed. And you come here every first Wednesday of the month believing that somehow or another God's truth is going to come out through this flawed human being. Everybody God uses is flawed except Jesus. Right? So the writers are flawed human beings. And there's a generation who believes that it is impossible for flawed human beings to produce anything perfect. Right? That there are human errors. We also know that all the writers had agendas that affected how they wrote and why they wrote. Now, I'm going I'm, I'm to put it into words to somebody y'all respect more about this. I'm going to put it into words to Dr. Judy Finches Williams, because sometimes people discredit me because I don't have my PhD yet. <laughs> y'all pray for me. I'm, I'm almost qualified for comprehensive exams. We are on our way. <laughs> Man, you know they released my reading list this week? That thing has 100 books on it, man. That's crazy. That's ha hazing. You got me? All right, all right. He's got his PhD, so we talk. Um, let me tell you what Dr. Judy Finch Williams said. She's a bad mamma jamma. We were at that Jude 3 conference, and we're sitting on this panel, and they were talking about how the Bible was the holy word of God, that it had law and, and poetry and, and inspiration and gospel. And Judy stood up and said, yep, and propaganda. You know what propaganda is? An intentional intent of an author to persuade you in a direction. What we seem to want to ignore is that the writers of the Bible had agendas. They were trying to persuade something, and their agenda was not historical facticity. They are not writing to give you an historical account like you expect when you read the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. These men had an agenda. Their agenda was oftentimes theological and most times political. Now, that doesn't mean that God's not in it, but let's not ignore the human element of the writers who had an agenda. They had an agenda. They were limited in their knowledge and understanding. And we now know for certain that the sciences contradict some of what is written in the Bible. We know the sciences contradict. There's no, there's really, I just don't know how people argue a seven day creation theory when we know how old the earth is. When we have archeological evidence of dinosaurs. We know these things existed. And they're, in seemingly con they're seemingly contradictory to some of the things we read in Scripture. Stay with me. Don't throw anything up here. I promise you it's going to get better before we're done. Not only is the human element seen in the writers, but the human element is seen in the interpretation. All scriptures interpreted. You can't just ask the question, what does the Bible say? Because the answer depends on who's reading it. Everybody has an interpretation. That's why, let me pause and tell you, it's dangerous to want to legislate Bible. We do not elect officials to legislate Bible. Do you want the right-wing evangelical Bible interpretation to be legislated? Hell no. I don't want that interpretation. We got the same Bible, and they interpret it much differently than I do, 
I don't want that interpretation on law. I know we want religious and Christian leaders, that's fine, in their morality and their ethics, but I don't want a leader to legislate Bible because they're going to legislate their interpretation. Jeff Sessions was quoting scripture to support Donald Trump. I don't want that in legislation. All the scriptures interpreted. <laughs> we, you and I can open up the Bible to the same passage and argue all day long. Renita Weems put it best. She said, you can only see from where you stand. Where you stand in life determines what you see in Scripture. And your interpretation is going to be very different than somebody else's because there's a human element in dealing with the Word of God. You can't just say, what does the Bible say? Because there's no answer to that. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Depending on your interpretation, where you stand, where your heart is, where you are in your walk with God. There's a human element in the interpretation. There's a human element in the writer's. And there's a human element in the context of creation. And by that, I mean of the scriptures. I promise this is the last deep and hard point. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with. How much does the context and the culture of the times when scripture was created affect the scripture. Say it again. How much does the context and the culture of the time in which scripture was written, how much does that affect it? Some things were shaped in scripture by the context in which they were written. Elijah, I had a New Testament professor ask a good question. He said, if Paul were alive in 2019, would he write the same things? Think about that for a moment. If Paul was alive today, would Paul write the same things? Would, in 2019, would Paul dare say, slaves, obey your masters? I mean, because we know as a society... Slavery is just wrong. It's not according to God's will. It is not godly to own human beings. So would the man of God, who we revere and who wrote half the New Testament, if he's alive in 2019, would that Paul write, slaves obey your masters? Would Paul dare say, women shut up in church? No. Look, look, how, look how quick. <laughs> Better not. He wouldn't have, well, he'd have a church down south, but I mean, he wouldn't have. Because as a society, we are evolving and understanding the equality of gender. And we wouldn't accept Paul in today saying women be quiet in church. Okay, I'm going to give you another example because that, that, that one didn't work. Because yeah. that, that issue is still being debated in, in the body, I get it. John chapter 8, woman is caught in the act of adultery. Y'all remember that one? The religious folk bring her to Jesus. And what are they prepared to do? Stone her. Think about that. They're prepared to throw stones at her until she is dead. Can, can you think of what that looks like? To stone someone? Throwing rocks at someone? Till they're dead? Here's the question I want to ask you. Why were they about to stone her? It was the law. It's written in scripture. A woman caught in the act of adultery is stoned. They were living out Bible in stoning her. That was the culture they lived in. Would we tolerate today Somebody being caught in adultery, being stoned? Is, is, I mean, some of you are like, yes, if that's... <laughs> yep, yep. If I caught him, that's what he's going to go through. <laughs> that, 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 right. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, and you would be in jail. 
Um, but, 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 but think about it. That's Bible. That's in Leviticus. Stone a woman caught in the act of adultery, and the man should be stoned as well. And we now live in a society where we know we would not stone someone for that kind of sexual act. It may be immoral, it may be wrong, but it's deserving of stoning. So that scripture in Leviticus is rooted in a culture so that now in 2019, we read it, but we don't apply it. If we saw someone from an African country that was still enslaved and they were freed, would we send them back? That's what Paul told Philemon, take the slave back. So here's my point, because our culture has evolved, there's certain things in scripture we have ab not abandoned, we have found our way around because we know this doesn't apply in our culture. So at some level, we know that the culture in which it was written affects how we interpret it in our own time. We found our way around slaves obey your masters because we knew slavery was wrong. We are finding our way around women should not speak in church because we believe in the equality of gender. What are we going to think 20 years from now about these seven passages of the Bible that you think are against homosexuality? How much does the culture in which it was created affect how we interpret it. Now, for some of you, that may mean nothing, but for me, it means a whole heck of a lot. Because what I seek to do is remove it from the culture and find a deeper principle that helps guide my life and my walk with God that is not tainted with the culture and that time in which it was written. I let Moses be a man of 500 BC. I let Paul be a man of 32 AD. We are not in 32 AD. We are not in 500 BC. We are in 2019. So what is the word of God for we who live in this day and in this world? There's a human element that we've got to deal with. And then thirdly, so we've got those who are fundamentalists. We've got those who deal with the human element. And then in the world today, you have those who see the Bible as flawed and contradictory. And they may say it's inspired, but it's not definitive. It's not authoritative. It's another book to read. Now, give me five minutes and we're out. What are the challenges? I'm not going to ask you to, to identify where you are once you think about it. But if you are a fundamentalist, if you believe God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Here's the pro and the con for you. The pro is you got scripture on your side. If you believe the Bible is the final authority, you got scripture to back you up. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. The word of God is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or tittle of God's word is untrue. If you are a fundamentalist, you've got scripture to back you up. Stand your ground. Believe what you believe. But here are your challenges. If you are a fundamentalist and you've got scripture to back you up, and you believe that the word of God is the final authority, you ought to ask the question, what does the Bible say? And once you find the answer, that's the end of it. Here's the problem you have, three of them. Number one, you are defending the authority of the Bible by quoting the Bible. Does that make sense? Okay, let me say it again. If you are a fundamentalist and you're in this first group that says this is what the Bible says, that's the end of it, you are defending the authority of the Bible by using the Bible. So this is what you're saying. You're saying the Bible has authority because the Bible says the word of God is true. You still don't get it. Okay, okay. Okay, so Sayana, let's say I'm going to tell you that 
you have to do what I say. I have authority in your life, in your household, right? I'm telling you that from this point on, you're going to do what I say, right? Your first response to me is going to be, well, because I know what you're going to say. <laughs> Let me see what your second response is going to be. Um, what makes me think I have authority in your household? And here's my answer, because I said I do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, it right, you'll receive, right. It's, it's me saying I have authority because I said I have authority. It's, it's almost true to the poison tree. You're saying the Bible is authoritative because the Bible says it's authoritative. You got me here? Some people, some, get, 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 get. You're quoting the same source to justify the authority, right? You're saying the Bible is eternal because the Bible says it's eternal, okay? That, that's fine for you, but you're going to have problems when you deal with people who don't agree to the same premise that you do. What are you going to do when you run up on a Muslim brother who says the Bible is flawed? You can't argue the authority of the Bible from someone who doesn't believe in the authority of the Bible. So that's your challenge. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying just know that you're arguing the authority of something from the very same something, and you can't justify the authority on the same source. So you can't say the Bible has authority and then quote Genesis. Right? Right? Okay. That, that's a problem. The second problem you're going to have, if you're a fundamentalist, and I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm just saying you have to be ready, is that you have to give an account for how some of the literal readings of the Bible are contradictory. Okay. Man, if I had time, I would point out to you seven, at least seven areas where the Bible seems to have just some, some error in it that needs to be dealt with. Um, can you give me 10 minutes to share with you a few or you want to go home? I mean, y'all ain't left yet. The folk already left, so if you want to leave, you'd have been gone. Okay. Um, I mentioned one already that it is physically impossible to account for the creation of the world in seven 24-hour periods, right? You, got, you, you, you knew you had to deal with that. You know you got to deal with dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> we know that there's certain stories in the Bible that are adapted from other Middle Eastern literature that preceded the Bible. Does everyone understand what I just said? There's a material in Scripture that we know is adapted from other literature that was existent before the Bible was. So, an in, in example, when God gets ready to destroy the earth uh, with the flood, in Genesis 6, we read that the sons of God had come down on earth and were having sex with women and giving birth to giants. Right? That's, Gen that's Genesis. See? So, so here, here's the problem, fundamentalists. You better make sure you read your Bible. Right? If, if, if you're going you to stand on a, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, you better know what's in there because somebody's coming for you. Right? And they're going to share with you that that story is adapted from some other Middle Eastern let literature and they'll show it to you and it's the exact same story and you got to be able to give an account for that. That the writer seemingly took what was known as a common myth and inserted it into Scripture. The sons of God having sex with women and giving birth to children, how, how do you answer that? I'm not saying you, how do you answer it? Give you another example. I want you to look up, since you all are Googling everything. <laughs> Boy, I know I'm gonna get some emails after this month. I want you to look up King Azahiah. Um, I'm gonna tell you where you can find him. Make sure I get these right. First Chronicles, right? No, Second Chronicles. So he's in Second Chronicles 21 and 22. And he's in Second Kings 8. Would you look up King Azahiah? And here's the problem. The Bible says that Azahiah is, he's the son of Jehoram. Right? Just, just stay with me. Let's listen. He's the son of Jehoram. His father died at age 40. They made him king. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles, he began to reign when he was 42. You almost caught it. He's the son of Jehoram. 
Jehoram dies when Jehoram is 40. As Ahiah begins to reign when his father dies and he's 42. You almost caught it. He's two years older than his dad. According to Second Chronicles, he's two years older. Second Kings, however, says that he was 22 years old when he began to reign. So he wasn't older than his dad. He's 22, but now you got to deal with the discrepancy. Because in 2 Chronicles, he's 42. In 2 Kings, he's 22. Right? You know what it is? Human error. Now, if you can acknowledge it and accept it, you can move on because you don't have to defend it. You can simply say somebody made a mistake in dating, dating his age. Or you can be a fundamentalist and say, nope, the Bible is without error. Okay, well, how is he two years older than his dad? Um, you you got you to answer for it, right? There's human error right here. Um, let me give you another example. Okay. Um, when Matthew in chapter 1 lists the genealogy of Jesus, right? If you're old school Baptist, you know that we preach and, and Jesus came down through 40 and two generations, right? Uh, it's, it's 42. Matthew says it's 42 generations, and what he does is he divides the lineage of Jesus into three segments of 14, because three times 14 is 42. So Matthew lists the genealogy of Jesus, 14, 14, 14. He says it's 42, two problems. Number one, he only lists 41 generations. He says it's 42, and only lists 41. Then number two, when you trace the real genealogy of Jesus in the Old Testament, it's much longer than 42. He's edited some people out. Right? He's edited it out to make them fit in to this category of three by 14 because there's a theological agenda in the three by 14. So Matthew has an agenda that causes him to edit the genealogy of Jesus to fit a pattern that's really not true. There's an author's agenda because there's a writer who has an agenda. Now, if you are like me and you believe there's human error in the Bible at times, you go, okay, Matthew made a mistake. What's the big deal? Let's talk about something else. Let's get the real truth out. If you're a fundamentalist, all right, well, how come Matthew's genealogy is wrong? You got to account for it. Uh, let me give you one more, one more. Mm, let's go on. Mm. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus says, according to Mark, that David went into the temple and ate the bread when Abiathar was high priest. But in 1 Samuel 21 and 2 Samuel 8, David ate the bread when his father Ahimelech was high priest. So here's a big problem. The Old Testament said it was David and Ahimelech. The New Testament, Jesus says it was David and Abiathar. So now you got a real problem. Is the Old Testament wrong or dare you say Jesus was wrong? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or can you say Mark got it wrong? All right? Human error or truth? So you've got a problem. You've got that you're using the Bible to defend the Bible. You've got these contradictory information. There's a whole lot more. You can actually Google them and find them out where the Bible has error. Every website is not to be believed, but they'll give you some biblical evidence. The third thing you're going to have issue with is the image of God that is portrayed in certain places in the Bible. There's certain images of God that ought to disturb you that we've just accepted. Let me give you two quick ones, and, and we're, we're out of here. I'll pick this back up. We'll, we'll talk if we're going to change next month. Okay. Two, two examples of images of God that all disturb you. One is in 2 Kings chapter 2. Write it down when you go home. This, this, 2 Kings chapter 2, let me give you the context. You all know that the major prophet in Israel is named Elijah, J-A-H. Elijah goes up to heaven and leaves his anointing with his mentee, Elisha. So Elisha is now in charge because Elijah is gone. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elisha is prophesying, and the Bible says that some kids come up and start teasing him because he's thinning hair. He's going bald. 
It's, it's, it's in there. If you're a fundamentalist, you better read your Bible. So Elisha gets teased by some kids because he's bald. And the Bible says that he turns to them and prophesies over them and curses them in the name of God. And two bears come out and kill 42 kids for teasing Elisha for having a bald head. Look at the look on your face. You look. Like, like, man, that ain't in it. Tell you, say it ain't in it. Yeah, it is. How do you feel about a God who sends two bears to kill 42 children for making fun of a prophet? I don't, that's one of those. So remember when I asked you, have you ever sat in church and you heard something, you went, you know what's happening to me now? I read the Bible and there's some places I go, That's not the God I serve. I don't subscribe to a God who sends bears to kill innocent children. You know another place that bothers me? We love the Exodus story. Don't we, Moses, bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He stand on the Red Sea, open up, they come through. The sea closed on Pharaoh, you know. Yeah, we love that story, right? It's the second part of the story that bothers me. Because after they come out of Egypt, when you get to the book of Joshua, you know what Joshua is all about? Joshua is God telling the children of Israel, this land is inhabited by all these folk. Kill them all and take their land. That's the book of Joshua. The first 13 chapters is God telling Israel, Kill everybody who's an inhabitant of this land, take it, claim it as your own, and keep all their good stuff. Now, what happens when Europeans land in America and they start reading Joshua? What happens? Oh, God told us, kill everybody and take their land and then build a wall and call everybody else an immigrant. Th that's a problem for me. Now, maybe it doesn't bother you. We, we, we preach all those Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and kill thousands of people to take their land. I read some of these and go, I got trouble with that image of God. That's not the God I serve. It's not the, it may be your God. And listen, you've got the right to be a fundamentalist, but when you deal with me, you better be able to answer that question. Why does God call for the destruction of innocent land? Why couldn't God give him another piece of land? You know who has real problems with these Joshua narratives? South Africans. You will not find a South African theologian who likes the book of Joshua because it's about colonization. And we don't know that because we have American freedom, but you talk to people who've lived in colonized lands and they will tell you how horrible it is for another people to come in, take your land, put you in a ghetto and tell you where you can and cannot go. You know who South Africans can't stand? Rahab. They can't stand Rahab. Why? Because the children of Israel are spies. They come into her house and she hides them. She hides the very people that will colonize her own people and protects them. And then they come in and destroy all of her people. And she wants only to keep her own home. South Africans call Rahab the greatest sellout in the Bible. Because you can only see from where you stand. And if you've ever stood in a colonized land, you see the Bible much differently. Well, it's time to go home. But let me help make it better. I believe in the human element. I'm becoming more aware of it. And this is the power of the word of God for me, that in spite of that human element, there's truth. That God speaks truth to my life in spite of all these faults and failures and contradictions and errors that I see in Bible, underneath all of that, there is a God who is speaking. So I, I don't know if Noah really built a boat and had 
that big of a boat to hold that many folk. But I do know this, God saves his people. Right? I don't know the truth of some of all these things, but I believe that there are deeper principles and that's where the study comes in. That's where the struggle comes in. That's where the research comes in. That's where the preaching comes in. When we get out of the culture and the context and find the divine truth whereby we live our lives and acknowledge that what I pull out may be different than yours. Here's where I leave you. The good news is that what makes me saved is not that I believe the Bible. Mm, catch me. It is not my belief in Bible that says I'm saved. It's my belief in Jesus. And if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I am saved. So this is my last point to you. So I argue this, that our belief in Jesus is where we're saved and everything else is debatable. We can debate everything else. We can debate what you think about this, what I feel about that, how you think about this. We can debate the women issue. We can debate the sexuality issue. We can debate the worship issue. We can debate the tithing issue. All of that is debatable as long as you have believed that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died, that he rose, and you've opened up your heart to him. Everything else is debatable because that ain't what saves me anyway. It's not my belief in Bible, it's my belief in the Lordship of Jesus. And after that, girl, think what you want, let's talk about it. Let's debate, let's have a good conversation and not put each other in hell. All right, all right. Let me, let me close in prayer, we're late. I thank you. I am um, working a lot of things out in my life and in my theology and my scholarship, and I thank you all for helping and being patient with me. Lord, our journey with you begins not in our understanding of Genesis or Revelation, but in our acceptance that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose, and that he lives inside of us. From there, our journey goes in some different directions at times. I pray, Lord, that you help me understand the journey you have me on. That I might be faithful to the God I know and the God I serve. And at the same time, accepting that my brother and my sister may be on a different journey. That you're dealing with them differently than you're dealing with me. And it's okay for us to see you differently and believe in you in different ways. Because we both believe in Jesus Christ. Lord, guard us now. We're going to have some discussion, some thought. But more than that, may we have a good night of sleep. May we rest tonight knowing that our souls are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Tomorrow when we wake up, give us a hunger to know you better, to study you more, to read your word, and to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in understanding. Keep us until we meet together again. In Jesus' perfect name we do pray. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, please have a blessed and beautiful night and may the grace of God go with you and you go with the grace of God. See you all next month for Kaya.